Hello, everybody. Welcome to this new FACT webinar. Today with us, we have Dr. Alex Timon. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for accepting our invitation. It is our great pleasure to have you here with us uh, this evening. Alex is the senior veterinary surgeon at the Tanki Sanctuary with a, and I know she will not like me to say this, but she's a world expert in donkeys and, and mules with a vast experience with his, with his equids and with a, with a vast international uh, experience both with working animals and with companion animals. So today, Alex will be talking about the most common conditions of the, the hoof in these two different types of equids, working and companion equids. Alex, once again, thank you so much and up to you. Thanks, Joe, and thanks for asking me. I feel honored. Um, I think one thing about working with donkeys is that you can be sort of expert to, to rubbish very quickly because... <laughs> They, they have a way of foiling your plans for treatment, don't they? Whether it's trying to find an abscess or trying to walk them into theatre. Um, so I, I think we'll just put some inverted commas around that word, shall we? Because the, the donkey's always the expert, really. Um, so we're going to just focus on some of the common things because clearly, you know, hoof disorders and all the things that go with it cover the subject of many books but let's just look at what probably most of us have seen in our working lives and are familiar with and just talk through and share ideas so I think it's fairly obvious that we have this quote you know no horse no hoof no no horse which can be um, obviously kind of rephrased to no hoof no donkey or mule and some of the problems we see relating to feet are hugely serious and affect the welfare of the animal in lots of different ways um, I thought by way of an introduction, we'd just start by reminding ourselves about the, the normal hoof anatomy and how kind of superbly adapted it is for the job it does. So you have these Indian wild asses here that have evolved to look like they're in body condition score three with eating what looks like five acacia leaves and that's pretty much it. They have beautiful strong legs and feet. And the hoofs themselves, this isn't actually one of their feet, but it's an Ethiopian donkey. You can see a really well-developed frog, uh, a beautifully scalloped uh, sole, and the white line where the sole and the hoof wall meet is barely visible. It's tight, and it's strong, and the hoof is an absolute marvel of adaptation. So we had these little sort of horse-like animals 50-odd um, million years ago with three digits, and as they started to evolve and become bigger and run faster, we sort of saw the digits moving up the limb and two of them becoming splint bones. And then 15 million years, we got the first one hoofed animals appearing. And then five million years ago, we got the kind of modern equus uh, hoofs onto the scene. And from then on, the hoof doesn't really change much in its anatomy and development because it is a perfectly functional system. And I've stolen the image from the Laminitis website, so apologies there, but um, it's a really good website and I, I do know the person who's made it, so I don't feel too bad. But I think it's important to remember that it's one of those structures that even if you don't have masses of advanced imaging techniques at your disposal, if you've got a really good knowledge of the anatomy of the hoof and what's in it, you can make some really good decision about how to treat and how to manage some of the problems that you see so you know if the animal has stood on a nail in the mid third of the frog and you remember that the navicular bursa is, is right underneath that then you don't necessarily need an x-ray to know this is an emergency situation you've got to treat that very radically so just the the quick reminder you've got the three hooves that are uh, three bones uh, distal to the fetlock so the the long and the short pastern and in the donkey, the short pastern has a slightly different arrangement uh, or sort of location than in the horse, which we'll see later, the pedal bone. And then we have the superbly adapted uh, hoof wall that's attached to the hoof by these interweaving Velcro-like lamini. So you have the, um, the, the bone and then the, the lamini coming here, which interlock with the hoof and the hoof wall tubules. And if they start to get inflamed or damaged and peel apart. It's obviously extremely painful for the animal, but then the hoof loses its integrity and can start to sink down. And then this beautiful picture of the inside of a horse's hoof where you have the sensitive lamini, which are attached to pedal bone um, here. 
and the insensitive of laminae which were attached to the hoof wall and again the two of those interlock and if you are unlucky enough to um, sort of go too far with your hoof knife and you come through to sensitive tissue the animal will tell you it will, it will bleed heavily and there'll be a lot of pain involved so those basic structures are complemented by the venous and arterial supply and I quite like on the top here, it says your horse has five hearts because you've got the frog, which should be pumping the blood back up the foot um, through the venous plexus. And when you have laminitis and you have damage to the coronary uh, corium, especially at the toe, these areas and these blood vessels will get damaged and we'll see poor quality horn subsequently and, and lots of sort of seedy toe and white line disease. So it's, it's really critical that we can try and maintain these, these blood vessels. And here we've got the sort of arterial circulation here um, all through the terminal arch of the hoof. So we had a, a sort of a quiz at the vet department the other day and I actually got this one right, which uh, maybe I am an expert, Jowl, but the organ that uses more glucose than the brain is in a horse is actually their hooves. So horses' hooves utilise more glucose than their brain. So I think that explains very much why they run before they think sometimes, um, that these are really metabolically active areas. Having said that about the foot, the foot is obviously the sort of distal end of the animal. It's attached to the rest of the donkey or horse. And if we are thinking about hoof problems, we must always perform a clinical assessment and take a history before we just go and focus in on the foot. So we've got three different situations here. We've got a donkey that has probably um, been seen at our new arrivals unit. It's in a very high body condition score and it's likely to have asinine metabolic syndrome potentially leading on to laminitis. We have the poof at the bottom, which is from a mule in America, and that's actually got selenium toxicity, so a dietary intoxication. And we have these, these rings on the hoof where you get abnormal growth because of the um, toxic uh, selenium that replaces uh, the phosphorus in the bonds there in the foot. And on the right, you've got this poor little pony in the Gambia who's got hoof problems in terms of broken back hoof pass and axis but you know the rest of him is suffering from malnutrition trypanosomiasis babesia all sorts of other things so there's not much point just doing a lameness assessment on these animals without thinking about the whole animal and it is quite shocking really with working animals just how high the prevalence of gait abnormalities is so Gait abnormalities, uh, lameness, depending on how you, you term it. Um, the Brooks done a lot of work in this, particularly in Pakistan and India. 90% um, of equines been considered having a gait abnormality in a study in 2005, which was looking at um, 5,000 working equids. And this one in Pakistan um, by Brosta et al, that came up with 100% of equids, working equids for lame at examination, which is fairly shocking really. And to think um, the, the slightly depressing thing is that it's, it's very multifactorial. So again, we've got to go right back at the whole life cycle of the animal to work out what's going on. They might've been worked too young. They might have congenital problems, very often overworked and overloaded, potentially harness injuries, which will make the gait abnormal or hobbling injuries. And then the animals that work in the urban areas tend to have much harder roads and tracks um, and a much different lifestyle. So they tend to have quite a number of injuries. And then as we'll talk about, the education and knowledge and farriery really impact upon the hoof itself. So just a few examples of these. This is the kind of um, horse that's been worked quite heavily in Egypt. It's a cart horse, but it's got terrible sickle hocks. It stands with its weight underneath it and its hooves are abnormal in the way their hoof pass and axis and strain of the tendons they're taking. So you can't make this foot better because the whole of the horse's hind limb conformation is abnormal. The donkey on the right was a foal that I remember. Well, this was a, an adult donkey that we had on one of our farms. And clearly it's got an untreated carpal valgus. And so it's got horrible medial lateral imbalance. And when we start to look at these animals feet, we have to remember to look at them from in front, from the side, from behind, look at them at walk and at trot if possible, and try and make sure that we um, grade the lameness perhaps. Um, so we can kind of come back and think about it if it's improving. So, some of the typical feet problems we see are very much related to conformation and work. 
So for example, the broken back foot past an axis in the donkey on the left hand side has got this kind of low heel conformation and is likely to be associated with strain or even precipitated by strain and overwork in the flexor tendons. We're going to see bruising at the heels. We're going to have the navicular bone potentially getting sore, solar bruising and toe separation. The animal on the right hand side with this flexural tendon uh, deformity perhaps and raised heel is very likely to have extensive process uh, pain, osteoarthritis of the coffin joint and perhaps pedal osteitis from extra concussion there. Again, these are things that you may not be able to correct, but they'll be contributing to the lameness and the animal in many cases still has to continue to work. Barriery is something that's, I mean, I think I was surprised when I started my sort of journey into looking at equines around the world, because in the UK, we're so privileged that farriers is a registered profession. They have a, a very long and dedicated training course, and you can't practice farriery um, unless you've gone through that. You can do trimming, uh, you have barefoot trimming, but you certainly legally can't put shoes on equines. And that's not the situation in most of the countries where um, many of your participants are from this evening um, and across the globe. So we're very lucky that people actually do want to trim animals' feet because it's a, it's a fairly thankless, hard, back-breaking task. And this, this you know, guy here from, from Mexico is, is cold and wet probably at the same time. And on the left, someone is trying to fit a metal shoe to a hoof. Um, it's a nice idea to protect it, but if you nail it in that position, you're going to be going straight through the sensitive tissues and causing a lot of damage. So we really need to work with all the service providers um, around donkeys and mules and horses when we want to improve um, hoof conditions. Clearly hoofs are attached to the foot, uh, to the rest of the donkeys we said, and in urban areas, you're much more likely to see road traffic accidents causing quite horrible um, lamenesses. And unfortunately, it's very often the case that euthanasia is not culturally acceptable. And so animals may continue to be kept alive or even to work with quite um, bizarre looking limb abnormalities, healed fractures of the cannon bone, healed fractures of the fetlock, which clearly in time will put strain on the contralateral limb um, or the ipsilateral hind limb. So these cases are quite depressing. You have chronic hoof deformities. You probably can't even pick up the leg and bend it to do farriery. Um, and you're too far down the line for people to accept the animal should be put to sleep because by the time the leg has healed, they sort of ambulate and eat. And unless you're very good at pain scoring and QBA, you may think that donkey is doing absolutely fine. And in the most severe cases, uh, clearly no hoof, no donkey, we have animals which actually have hoof avulsions. So this is not uncommon. The whole hoof has actually been um, taken away by injury. Um, not much you can do in that case, is there? Interestingly enough, the surveys on companion stroke athletic equines in the UK, I mean, Agile didn't give me a huge amount of notice for this talk, so I'm afraid I didn't trawl all the literature, but there's going to be a lot of literature um, in the athletic world and the racing world sponsored by Horse Race Betty Levy Board about lameness in horses. But I don't think that's probably what we want to hear about tonight. So the most comparable thing for horses in the UK would be the National Equine Health Survey that's carried out by the Blue Cross World Horse Welfare and Beaver, the Equine Veterinary Association. And just a snapshot uh, last year, 32% of equines were registered by the owner as being lame, of which about half were upper limb lamenesses and about half were um, in the foot. So 21% laminitis and 32% other foot lamenesses of which 10% were pus in the foot. So straightforward conditions that we can diagnose and treat in the field without too much specialist equipment. We don't have comparable data for all the donkeys in the UK, but from our own herd, which comprises about two and a half thousand donkeys, we have about 10% of the herd a year is lame. And of that, about 50% is pus in the foot. We also have about 4% of the herd a year developing laminitis. And of that, about 35% is acute and about 65% is chronic. 
and remember that our donkeys are well managed. I mean, Jal will, will recognize the fact that we have got strip grazing. We do have grooms that know when donkeys are lame. So I think the incidence of laminitis across many countries, um, including the UK, would be a lot higher. Our data is from a herd that is potentially relatively well managed, although the donkeys are kept in environments that perhaps aren't the most suitable. So coming on to that, really, uh, why do we see hoof problems in donkeys particularly? And often it's because they're in the wrong place. So the environment uh, where many companion donkeys live is full of lush grazing and people that show their love through food, either in buckets or going out for walks. And that produces um, a lot of strain on the donkey's um, you know, normal abilities. It produces too much fat and that will cause metabolic syndrome. In the equine population, we're going to have hoof disease through athletic conditions. In both cases, we have neglect and lack of knowledge as being very um, important things in hoof conditions. So I don't think anybody can sort of feel they're doing a fantastic job. This donkey on the left, the little brown donkey, was from Ireland. So it's just across the water from us. And in the UK, owners have access to, to money, to food, to free education and schooling, to vets and to huge amounts of education. But this animal has still been allowed to have neglected hooves that have compromised its welfare. The donkey on the right from a market in Kenya has also got overlong hooves that have bent and twisted on itself. Um, and in this case, the people have none of the access to the things we've mentioned. So perhaps it's more understandable that problems have arisen, but neglect of the animal can happen wherever you are in the world. And we're just going to run through a little bit of how donkey hooves in particular are different from horses because not everybody is aware of this. But I've put the x-ray there to demonstrate ignorance because this was a vet that I spoke to two weeks ago who sent this x-ray in of a donkey they'd looked at, which was potentially going to travel 200 miles to the sanctuary. And they said, oh, yes, lots of donkeys and ponies have feet like that. I think it's fine to travel. Um, I hope there's a sharp intake of breath that all your microphones are off, but I disagreed very strongly that this donkey was fit to travel 200 miles with a foot x-ray like that. But the vet, in their wisdom, felt they'd seen a lot of feet like this and it was OK. So why do donkeys get to this state? Well, they have a foot that's designed for arid countries and they can take up more water. They have slightly steeper feet uh, in terms of what they do they walk along narrow tracks and at long slow speeds they don't race they haven't got that sort of long broken back foot past an axis with easy break over like the racehorse position of p3 in the hoof is different so the vet has correctly identified that but not as much as that and the weight bearing is slightly different sadly they're also very long suffering and stoical um, they will continue to work for you even if they're in pain as everyone is aware of the mule hoof, I'm not an expert. Uh, Jal's more of an expert on mules. I think the hoof can be quite intermediate. It often is very similar to a donkey in terms of its strength and hardship, which is why it's been an animal that's used um, and bred particularly for sort of carting and for work during the war because it was so such a strong animal. Um, but in sometimes in the shape of the hoof, they can be a little bit more rounded like the horse. So if we just sort of mention that for those people who aren't aware or haven't seen this, picked on the right would be a typical horse split section where the extensive process of the pedal bone is pretty much parallel with the coronary band and the pastern sits outside the hoof. That's a short pastern, the long pastern and the navicular bone. The frog tissue is big digital cushion that's coming back and pumping the blood up the leg about halfway here between the front and the back of the pedal bone. So quite a nice supportive thing if you're thinking of fitting a heart bar shoe. Typical donkey, however, we have the coronary band here and the extensor process here. And actually there's quite a big difference. We have normal measurements between about one and 1.3 centimeters as this what's called founder distance as a normal in most donkeys. And the frog tissue actually sits more like a third um, of the way between the tip of the pedal bone and the um, end of the pedal bone. So again, fitting a frog support tissue, frog support to this type of um, frog may not help the donkey if it's got an acute laminitic episode. Generally, we think the hoof is about five to 10 degrees more upright than the horse. 
can be altered obviously by trimming, uh, but that's slightly more upright hoof. They're often also slightly toe out because most donkeys tend to be quite base narrow. So quite narrow chests, slightly toe out, which does help them, as I say, if they're doing their normal kind of work. And from a radiographic point of view, we have this displayed by the top of the coronary band here and this top of the extensor process here, which would normally be about 10 millimetres. And obviously the hoof wall and the pedal bone and the hoof pattern axis should be in alignment. And the solar depth should be about a centimetre. So if you have the luxury of x-rays and the donkey's sole is only about five millimetres thick, it's going to be very sore walking on sort of stony and hard ground. Some of the studies also indicate that weight bearing in the donkey is slightly more caudal than the horse. So they have, um, my screen is cut off a little bit by the zoom talk. We've got one, two, three, four, five weight bearing areas, but three of them are sort of caudal to midway of the hoof. And so that means that when you're resecting, for example, for seedy toe, you can actually take more off without the hoof being unstable. So that's kind of just some of the anatomy of the foot that I think it's important that we're aware of. And now what I want to do is just go through some of the conditions which are really common in the animals that we see. So seedy toe, we see a huge amount of it because our donkeys live in these kind of wet, moist environments. So I'm sure you all see it as well. You get this kind of mixed uh, bacterial fungal infection going um, between the sort of uh, hoof wall, the white line area, and this just eats the way these keratinophilic um, organisms right the way up the hoof and which they then secondarily get infected. So we have to trim those out and potentially be quite radical in trimming them out and then keep the hoof wall dry and clean, which is a bit of a tall order um, for us this time of the year when we have mud and water everywhere. So the best we can often do is get them picked out multiple times a week, sprayed with iodine. Uh, we also have copper sulfate now impregnated mats that the animals walk through, which helps to harden the hoof and protect it from bacteria. So seedy toe sounds innocuous, but actually it's an extremely serious condition, especially if it's in, in multiple areas of the hoof. Um, and continual debridement is necessary. And you also have to remember to sort of sweep up uh, what's gone onto the floor and clean your tools with Vercon in between animals, because there is certainly a risk that we're going to be transmitting some of these keratinophilic fungi and bacteria to other animals if we just go straight on to the next patient. Brush is very common, again, in animals that have to stand in moist, wet areas for any length of time. And we get a foul smelling discharge, uh, typically around the frog and the frog sulci, and it can become sore and infected. And unfortunately, in I have been unlucky enough to see this, but only in a couple of cases. And one was uh, one of our big breed Poitou donkeys. Uh, it was difficult temperament for the grooms to pick up its feet. Um, and it did gradually develop canker, which is this um, sort of rampant fungal infection of the frog tissue, which then eats into the sole. And it's a very hard condition to treat. And we took ours to surgery um, twice and actually the canker eroded through to the pedal bone. And then we had to put the donkey down um, partly because he wasn't tolerating bandage changes and he was almost 15, 16 hands high and it was just very difficult to deal with the animal. Um, but again, moist underfoot conditions are not great for equine hooves. They're dry sort of grassland species that need to keep those feet in good hard condition. Predisposing factors. So these, these we've just mentioned that. Um, and one other one which people forget sometimes is the nutrition. So very often we give donkeys, mules and horses diets that lack essential vitamins and amino acids, whether they're working equine, being fed plastic bags on a, on a rubbish heap and then expected to go out and do, you know, 12 hour shift or whether they're a, a donkey being kept on a starvation paddock with a bit of straw, they're going to become deficient in biotin, methionine, selenium, zinc, and all the small micronutrients that are required in the correct proportion for hoof development. So again, when thinking about hoof disease, think about the whole animal, ask the owner what they're being fed, don't just look at the seedy toe to actually grow a new hoof, hoof you need um, a good balance in your diet. And I think we have to remember that. Solar and white line abscesses. I mean, the, these are the things which, you know, I still dread, even though I've been doing, as Giles said, donkey feet for a long time. 
they, they are difficult. Uh, we often have to search multiple areas of white line disease rather than just removing a shoe where there's been nail bind. Uh, we often find that the pus tracks either upwards to the coronary band or potentially even inwards to the pedal bone, and they can be challenging to treat. And obviously in severe cases, uh, this is a donkey, the working donkey. Um, we've had an abscess that's actually gone right through and the pedal bone is now appearing um, together with some really nasty kind of infected material. So don't underestimate these. And also remember that many of our patients won't have tetanus vaccination. Um, again, don't think this is just confined to, you know, working equids whose owners don't have the finances. Um, Elena Barrio, who uh, is country manager for Spain Donkey Sanctuary now, did a PhD looking at all the preventative measures that should or that weren't being taken by owners as they admitted donkeys to the donkey sanctuary. And we had very low vaccination rates against tetanus and flu of donkeys coming into us. So remember that if you see animals with white line disease, white line abscesses, coronary band abscesses, don't forget that tetanus is a very high possibility. So Clostridia tetani getting in um, and causing uh, spasms throughout the animal. This, this little donkey in Ethiopia was put to sleep shortly after we took this photo. He was developing pressure sores from lying down and seizuring multiple times a day. Um, and unfortunately was developing joint infection in both hip and shoulder, um, again, through a, a small penetrating wound. So again, think of the whole animal, not just the foot. I can't repeat that often enough, really. Pedal bone infection, if you're lucky enough to have a radiograph, then you can certainly start to see these kind of nibbled lesions. Um, if you're unlucky enough, then the clinical siglament is normally an animal that's not responded to pain relief and potentially pus hasn't drained and is um, non-weight bearing lame for three days, I would be really suspicious then of an infection deep in the bone. And if I didn't have access to, to theatre, I would certainly think about starting antibiotics as well as getting drainage going. Um, and this is just, you know, taking the donkey into theatre, putting a tourniquet on, because all those blood vessels that we saw are going to play havoc with your, your visibility. You won't be able to see a thing once you make an incision in the foot and take the hoof wall away if you've got blood everywhere. So we need to remember to put a tourniquet if we're going to be exploring the hoof in any detail. Moving on to some of the other conditions that we see. Um, flexural deformities are relatively common, I think. Um, and it's quite interesting in working equines, it often is in the hind limbs, potentially because of a hind limb suspensory desmitis, um, causing a sort of gradual pain response and constriction there. The donkey on the left is one that I see regularly in Cyprus in the sanctuary. And I mean, I have to admit that from sort of fetlock upwards, this donkey moves absolutely normally. <laughs> it's learnt to walk so long now on its sort of dorsal pastern that actually it moves brilliantly but you can see you can't trim the foot properly and ideally this shouldn't have happened what you want to do is to be able to get these small potentially congenital um, flexural deformities treated at an early stage so again relatively common perhaps if you're overfeeding a donkey because you might get an imbalance there in the growth between the uh, cannon and the tendons but also I think relatively common in working equines from pain uh, in the hoof, probably toe pain, which means they start to um, weight bear abnormally. The, distal, the deep flexors contract, they start to go up on their heels and as the pain continues, they go up on their heels more. And that's when you gradually get this sort of tipping over of the foot. So here we have what's called a type two deformity. So the hoof wall is now past the dorsal. Um, the previous one, it was, um, not quite vertical here, it's past vertical. And in this case, is, um, we have kind of two options. And certainly the one that is easy, perhaps if you're surgically minded, is to make a small incision under a local anesthetic, so a four point block here and some local, and you can just cut the deep flexor tendon. It moves part, and then the foot, if it's not chronic, can be restored to normal condition with shoeing. But I have seen some photos and x-rays from Jesus, one of our vets that used to work in Portugal, and he worked really uh, well on a few cases using metal shoes and just gradually lowering the heels and doing toe extension has actually achieved remarkable results. So I think depending on what you're familiar with and the deformity is, you may not have to resort to surgery, you might manage with shoeing. 
I think the problem is with some of the smaller donkeys that we have, fitting a metal shoe is quite difficult and the plastic shoes tear if they're under too much tension, uh, whereas the larger donkeys um, Jesus was dealing with could be shod with metal shoes, which gave them a little bit more traction and the ability to manipulate those hoof paths and angles perhaps more successfully. That's kind of my theory. Um, I'm not sure. Oops, hang on. I seem to be going back now for some reason. Let's just press forward. All right, sorry. Okay, um, I've just put this in because injuries are really common in working equids. And I think one of the things that we often do is a really beautiful job at repair. So here someone's got some lovely biosyn sutures in and the foot's been put back together really well. But if we don't manage to look after that injury and protect it um, for the long term, it will probably break down. So that's where things like a foot cast can be really useful and actually very economical compared to putting bandages on on a daily basis. Okay, so I'm gonna just move on to look at um, the conditions that perhaps <clears throat> we see more than you do from other countries and that would be the laminitis. So the donkey doesn't always stand in this nice fashion that, like the textbook says, it often just lies down and looks fairly miserable and ends up with a chronic hoof and chronic radiographs. But this is the classic posture where you're trying to take weight off the toe and throw it backwards. We often just see subtle weight shifting or an animal lying down. So again, because these aren't worked, we'll often just see them um, being over, overlooked by owners. So the donkey's lying down in the morning, lying down in the evening, they didn't notice and the prodromal phase has gone and now we've got full rip roaring laminitis going on. And I think these, these are sort of slightly depressed me really because these come from animals that have been walked off lorries and brought to the donkey sanctuary, um, perhaps in the days before we requested radiographs of things we we're worried about. So this donkey has hobbled and onto a transporter and been transported and inside its foot, you can just see how the pedal bone has demineralized and just become a little stump um, with all this kind of laminal wedge here. It, it's just horrible, it's irretrievable. Here's the frog back here. There's no way a, a frog support would help that. Um, and this is the similar radiograph. And again, I think it's, it's sometimes really helpful to see the split section because a radiograph in black and white, I don't think it really tells you what's going on. And when you start to see images like that, or you can show them to, to clients, they understand a lot better the sort of pain that must be going on um, if your bone is sitting inside this all day. I sometimes say to, to people, put on stiletto shoes and walk around for an hour or so. Um, and even if you're a bloke and you, you know, put stiletto shoes on, you'll, you'll realise they're horrible. And that's kind of what's going on when you're squeezing your toe into something here and raising your heel up. How can we treat these? Um, not the time and the place to go into all the medications because hopefully the vets will know and if you're not the vet then you know it's probably not not sensible to tell you but some things you can do for yourself are icing so if we keep the distal limb um, iced for 48 hours we change these bags about every four hours as the ice melts we stop the inflammatory mediators being released and the hoof has a much better chance of not um, developing stage where the lamina actually separates. So this is something that's really useful and we've used it a lot more over the last few years. And farriery, so at the chronic stage when the hoof is starting to recover, a good farrier who can fit a rim shoe perhaps and some acrylic gel in here which will provide some comfort for the animal as it walks is an essential part of the rehabilitation process. I just put that in here because we don't see that many like this anymore, but this is a donkey with PPID, so um, Cushing's disease. And we often pick them up now to blood test at a younger age, but the classic sign always used to be that they didn't shed their hair coat and got this long, long hairy coat as well as perhaps been uh, drinking too much as a side effect of the hormones. So I say, we, we often don't see that, we'll pick it up on a blood test, but a geriatric animal that's developing laminitis, which perhaps it shouldn't do, it's only got access to normal food like straw as in this stable. This would be the type of animal we'd want to test if its ACTH was normal or not, because potentially we can treat that um, with a straightforward medication for life and reduce its risk of laminitis. And I just also, sorry, I think in the last slide, just to remind us that 
obviously asinine metabolic syndrome, which we mentioned for the very fat donkeys, being the endocrine disorder, we might also want to think about measuring insulin. So we certainly can nowadays think about blocking some of the insulin pathways, blocking some of the extra ACTH and providing treatment options that weren't there a few years ago. Just want to mention one other lesion which you might or might not have seen or come across, but these kind of flaky, poor quality, linear defects on a hoof combined with often a white line that then diverges and then continues on, potentially recurrent abscesses that may burst out the coronary band. We recognize these as a tumor, a non-malignant but space occupying lesion called a keratoma. So here quite a nice smooth punched out radiograph, not irregular like an infection, quite smooth. And on a cut section uh, taken transversely through the hoof, you can see this tumor just starting to push in to the hoof here, uh, into the pedal bone. And unless you actually remove that surgically by cutting through the hoof wall under GA and removing it, it will just expand and get bigger and bigger. So if you have an animal that keeps getting white line deformity and abscesses in the same place and you have access to a radiograph, just think to yourself, could I be looking at a keratoma? Because that removing the keratoma has got a better long term prognosis than just keeping on repeating treating the poultice. So I think our time's nearly up because we're getting, we normally, I think, um, Giles said we talk for sort of half an hour and then have questions, but what's the kind of solution to all of this? Um, and I think really it's going to be education. Education in lots of ways. I mean, this was a farrier workshop in Cairo. We were had a, a group of professionals and we were trying to find fun and interactive ways to work with the community. Uh, this is poor old Kevin, who was our director of um, global programs at the time. He's very good naturedly having his foot picked up. Um, and you know we're demonstrating picking out a hoof and just making it a bit of fun for people. This is something that, that needs to be done and often isn't done, but you're gonna remove stones, you're gonna check for foreign bodies, you're going to get dirt out. We're gonna just make owners part of the process of looking after the foot. It's not all someone else's problem. They've got a really big role in it. I love the fact that everyone wants to watch a farrier. Not many people want to be a farrier, but lots of people want to watch a farrier because it's great watching someone else work. Um, and I think farrier training is, is really vital. It's something that we go to the farrier schools in the UK and talk to farriers. Um, it is difficult across lots of European countries to find people that want to work with feet. Um, again, Jao, you'll, you'll recognise Bob here, who's farriering one of your big breed donkeys. Um, absolutely fantastic. But it's bloody hard work isn't it <laughs> and you can see why it's not necessarily going to be the profession that people want to go into so we have to encourage them and make it a viable profession for them and it can be really rewarding to treat these animals that was that little Irish donkey we showed you right at the beginning and he's got a pain response here hasn't he neck sort of level with withers ears back tense eyes tense muzzle tense nostrils horrible posture five years later feet have been trimmed and look at him now, absolutely happy. So a really rewarding thing once you can treat some of these foot conditions. And just as a sort of small advertisement, I guess, we have just um, opened the Donkey Academy today, which has got online courses on lots of donkey things. And you can obviously download the donkey handbooks for free. So thank you. That was a brief run through of some of the conditions of companion and working donkeys. So I hope that's long enough, Jal, and we can have some chats. It was perfect, Alex. Thank you. Thank you so much. I know how hard it is to, to be able to explain all these different disorders and diseases in a little bit more than half an hour. So thank you for that. I will now open the, the, the session for questions. You can either, we have 28 participants, so you can either text the message in your chat or you can just open your microphone and ask directly to, to Alex. It's nice to see some familiar faces or familiar names here. Atish from Nepal. Hello, Natish. And Belen, I think you're um, from Portugal, aren't you? So it's nice to see you. Hi. Oh, and Miguel. Hello. <laughs> nice to see you too. You must have lots to say about feet that I've missed out. Let's see if someone come with hi with questions. I, I do have a few. Maybe I can yeah yeah melt get the ball the rolling, or maybe yep, you can help me yep. with the answers. <laughs> Couple of things. Uh, when when you mention about that's one of it's a multifactorial uh, problem, 
when it's linked to hooves, you mentioned two things. You said that animals are too young to work. Yes. So that's my first question. When young is too young. So basically when animals should start working, that's my first question. And then you also mentioned urban and rural environments. So that brings another huge discussion. There's the use of horseshoes or animals working on barefoot. So can you just give yeah. us a, some idea about these two topics? Well, I think the, the data tends to show that donkeys growth plates closes about six months later than horses. So we shouldn't really be doing much work with them until they're late three to four. Four is probably safer. But I appreciate that during that slightly younger period, they may be harnessed alongside an older animal and getting used to the game, if you like, um, just so they know the behaviours associated with carting or with carrying. But in terms of load bearing, it was sensible not to work them until they've reached um, skeletal maturity. Again, thoroughbreds clearly are going to be raced as two-year-olds, which is quite controversial in the UK. Um, they're tried to, they try to make sure they breed as close to 1st of January as possible, so they're as mature as possible, and they're fed an intensively perfect diet um, and then monitored extremely carefully. But you wouldn't want to bring your average horse into hard work until it's uh, not only skeletally mature, but robust. So, you know, the four to start, the five to six to work properly. I mean, I'm sure that's that's would agree with you, wouldn't it, Joel? Yeah, and as well, mentally mature, because some of the tasks yeah. can be quite challenging. For example, working in the forest is not the same as plowing a field. So you need to have animals that are not only physically prepared, but also uh, mentally prepared. There's a question here in the chat. I don't know if you want me to read it or you yeah, can I just... Can the long gestation period, yep. what's the outcome of working a pregnant donkey? I mean, it's a, it's a brilliant question. I doubt anyone's really done any evidence base on that. Um, I mean, in many cultures, it's more likely to be the stallions that work hard and the mares are kept for breeding in a different place. But I think... Yeah, it, it is tricky, isn't it? I don't know the correct answer to that one, to be honest with you. I mean, I, I think the, the fetus tends to sort of suck everything for the mare at the expense of the mare and actually often can be in quite a good condition despite the mare becoming very drained herself. But I think the outcome is likely to be, um, you know, the mare is in particularly poor condition and the fetus often has a poor start if it hasn't got the correct milk supply. But I don't think you're going to find evidence on that one because it's a bit controversial to study it, isn't it? <laughs> um, what, do, what do you think, anyone who's aware of working at quids with pregnancy? I mean, it's a question we don't really even look at on the ears assessment, is it? No, it, it, it's links as well. What do we mean with working? Is that carrying a light uh, load? Because you see animals that they are working animals and traditionally farmers used to work with the mares until they are 10 months pregnant. You know, they just rest the last the last month because it was a continuous work and they just keep the animals working and they reduce the amount of work, but they are still working. It's, it's, it's a little bit tricky. What do we mean with work? Is the animal working in the, in the correct conditions? Is the animal overworked? There's a lot of factors that may affect that, that decision and that calendar when working and the results of working with pregnant animals. Mm -hmm. Alex, there's another question from, from Lynn in the, in, the, in the chat. They said, when using a cast on a hoof, does it need to be changed or is it one time? It is also slippery to walk on. Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, quite often the, the cast will be slippery at the, the bottom. And so it's, it's usual to put some acrylic um, on the bottom there so they can't um, slip and they'll also be kept in a stable environment rather than just walking around with the cast on because you've got to be quite careful but it is fairly typical to put um, something on the bottom of the cast there to, to protect it and to make it less slippery. Generally you can leave them in place for um, 10 days to two weeks if everything's fine before you check but you do um, normally need to check them at least once during the process. I mean, it's, it's difficult with feet to bivalve them. If you're doing a limb cast, we often would bivalve it. So you create the cast, um, let it set, and then cut the cast, you know, in two parallel lines, and then you can replace the cast with a bandage and then check the wound on a regular basis. And that's not very easy with a hoof cast, I'm afraid, just because it's so hard to put the two bits back together and then it, to maintain that integrity. Um, but even so, you think of the cost of bandaging a foot 
multiple times a week, um, it's actually really expensive. So yes, we would um, not change it too often, but obviously you're monitoring, you know, the skin around it, you're monitoring the pain, you're monitoring the lameness, you're monitoring the temperature, you're looking for all the signs of cast, rubs, etc. You're You're making that decision on an individual basis as to how long you, you're going to be happy to leave it for. Thank you, Alex. Another question from Jimmy from Mexico that says, hello, in cases of vesicular stomatitis, what would be your recommendation? Ooh. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I think people who've seen vesicular stomatitis might need to come and help me here. I mean, in, in what respect, in terms of how it affects the coronary band and the, the feet and then the, the sort of mucous membranes? Um, there there are a lot membranes. of cases in Mexico. So I, I, yeah. I believe here is a little bit what is the outcome of the disorder and how this affect the, the working equids uh, life in general? <sighs> well, I mean, it's, it's a very, um, it, as I say, it's not a condition that I've actually seen. So, Jal, are you going to talk about vesicular stomatitis in Mexico for me? I saw it, you know, and, and yes. the truth is that it can... So, I mean, my experience would be from a book. So, what your, your real life experiences, yeah. please. I think it's a little bit a little bit like in other hoof diseases. It's linked with when you diagnose it, you know, you diagnose it and how quickly you apply the treatment and how severe the animal is affected. And I know this is a vague uh, answer, but it's actually linked with that. In, in some of the cases, it's just too late and, you know, and it's, it's, and because it's also multifactorial, many, there are many things affecting here, but, you know, as, as a, a, a broad answer, I saw animals with vesicular stomatitis with a lot of problems and still working. And this is the typical thing that we really don't want to happen, right? We have, we want animals with these conditions to be rest and uh, well looked after so they can recover before, before they, they go back to work again. And that's really important. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I do have a question here. I don't know if you want to go back to the, to the barefoot and the, and the horseshoes, uh, the one I, I asked you before. Uh, I know it's, it's, it's a big question, but what, what is your opinion about working animals working on, on barefoot versus animal using horseshoes? Yeah. Um, barefoot is fantastic for lots of animals. And we obviously have to be careful with the training and education of people who are going to do it, because in some cases there are some slightly odd ideas about the treatment or not of things like abscesses and some welfare connotations that go with it. But the basic premise of allowing a strong, healthy hoof to develop um, without the, you know, the support of a shoe is, is very good. And some animals will really recover if the shoes are taken off and they're put on the correct type of diet and environment, they will do extremely well. I think the problem often comes in these urban areas, if they're worked too hard, the amount of hoof growth may not keep up with the amount of attrition from the concrete etc so you're just physically wearing away on a hard surface the amount of hoof that's there but having said that some of the shoes that are put on in urban areas can be really poor so often you know they're, they're not well fitted they might be made out of quite odd materials having said that not all local materials are bad um, but they often don't fit very well and can actually be a source of problem rather than a solution. So I think in the right hands and with a really good, strong animal, a shoe is often unnecessary. But in an animal that's got to um, work so hard that its feet are being worn out, then it may be important to provide a shoe. I mean, again, that's a, a vague answer, but I think it sort of is, is how you know, the horse's foot is, is not designed to be continually ground away by the hard surface. It's, it's designed to recover. And that's often what working equids don't get. Thanks. Thanks for that. Um, well, we don't have more questions in the chat. So I do have a last question for you, Alex. I see many donkeys with chronic laminitis and they are still being used as working animals. And although they can, it can be very painful while acute, as soon as the laminitis become chronic in donkeys, they seem to cope better than horses. Is that because they really cope better than horses or is that because they are more stoic than horses and they don't show the pain? Mm, fascinating question, isn't it? I 
wonder if it's a combination of lots of things. I mean, often in those chronic laminitis cases, um, the sole, I mean, I've got lots of slides of it, which I haven't shown, but they often have quite a thick sole because people haven't trimmed it away. So they have quite a lot of cushioning between the pedal bone and the, the ground. In many cases, they have these really big blocky feet with some of the chronic laminitics. And I think we also get used to a certain way of walking. So if you are going to an event, a horse has to be kind of trotted up to pass the vet inspection and is graded on whether it's lame in trot, um, lame on a corner. We are lucky if we get our donkeys to walk in a straight line in many cases, and we start to tolerate these quite abnormal gates, which if this was a working horse or an athletic horse, we wouldn't. So I think our brain has become downregulated to accept that a donkey walks like that. They shuffle, they have a short stride, they don't yeah. track up, they don't turn corners very well, but we start to think that's normal. And I think what's interesting is when people do these quite long QBA studies and put videos on the donkeys and actually examine their pain faces mm -hmm. and how they're responding, especially at times of day when they're not aroused by humans, we do often see more discomfort. Um, and I think we sometimes underestimate what's going on for them when we ask them to do things. But I agree, they can shuffle around and look okay. But so many of us have got used to donkeys just looking okay. We've almost forgotten what a happy donkey, you know, careering around a field as a youngster is like. And I think that's our fault if you like that in literature in history in culture the donkey plays such a role as the um i don't know the fall guy the the poor man's horse that we're sort of used to it being like that and so i think sometimes we tolerate things that we wouldn't in other species thank you final final question from tamara from chile she says hi alex how challenging is to get owners to rest extremely challenging um obviously if somebody's livelihood is a, a donkey or a horse they have to continue to work it pretty much as you know if you can't afford to re replace your car you just have to keep driving it until it falls apart um if the studies by brooks show you've got 100 percent of animals working that are lame it kind of tells you that they won't rest the animals the only times when you can get and to rest the animals is probably when NGOs step in and offer to take the animal for a period of time as a loan them out another donkey. But it's really hard, I think, for us to appreciate the levels of need and poverty for some of the owners of these animals. Um, you know, we, we don't have free schools, we don't have healthcare systems, we don't have a, a welfare state that's going to pick up if you can't feed your child. And so, yeah, you're not going to rest your animal, and unfortunately. 100% of animals working when lame is a reflection of a community problem, isn't it? Um, someone's put, what's the effect of working terrain on donkey's hoof? What's the difference for donkey hoof carrying loads on hard concrete roads? Yeah, I mean, that's a good one, isn't it? I mean, the terrain has a huge effect. I mean, we're looking um, a lot at our underfoot donkey conditions. Typically, we've had wood chip, which has been lovely and soft but actually we've got keratinophilic fungi living in it, which are scoffing the white lines and causing lots of white line disease. And we're trying to switch to things like sand in our tracks, for example, at the moment, which is much more, um, much harder and less likely to cause problems. And yes, if you've got hard concrete, it, it's really typical that if we put a new load of concrete down and the farrier comes and trims, it's often, you know, donkey's lane the next day, hard concrete is very abrasive. Um, and it, it's not the surface that uh, Equid was designed for. All the, um, the tendons, the, the, the cannon bone, the splints, they all suffer if you have to trot for a long time on a concrete surface. Um, I, I think that's where the debate about putting shoes and putting um, you know, rubber, et cetera, underneath the shoes that people do to reduce concussion has a place, I think, that you know, animals can't work on hard concrete surfaces without getting concussion. You, you can't run with your trainers on hard concrete as long as you can on a field. It, it's hurty, isn't it? Yeah. I think, Jal, you're on mute, Jal, by the way. Your, your mouth is talking, but nothing's coming out. <laughs> I think that's... <laughs> that's better. <laughs> I was just saying, Alex, 
thank you so much for being with us tonight. It's been a, an incredible webinar uh, with, with lots of interesting questions. Uh, thank you so much for letting people know that the, the Danke Academy is is on now and it's it's ready for no, thank people. you and also thank you for the question about vesicular stomatitis because I'm, I'm now going to go and scurry off and find out more about it because i said that obviously feels like a bit of a gap there i'm gonna have a good look thank you <laughs> i'd love to learn something new and of course i was just focused that on on the hoof because being a, a viral disorder usually they see first the mouth lesions yeah. before they see the, the coronary bands lesions yeah. you know? Some yeah, no, I, know, I know the coronary band lesions, but maybe maybe next time we have a presentation about one of those viral diseases. Um, we, just need to so ask the, the teams we, we don't see them very often, then I can sit and ask a question. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, thank you so much for your Thank for you your very much. Right, I will say goodbye in that case. Bye, guys. Nice to see those of you who thank I know. You. Nice bye to bye. meet new friends as well. Bye-bye.